There are two basic claims put forward as proof that the Qur'an is a miracle from God. The traditional one is that the Qur'an's eloquence and beauty is beyond the ability of a human being to produce. The second and more modern claim is that the Qur'an reveals scientific facts long before they were discovered. Firstly, a great deal is made of Muhammad being illiterate, as if that means he couldn't have composed the Qur'an. Actually, most people were illiterate in 7th century Arabia. Knowledge and skills were passed on orally. Reading and writing was not an essential skill. And the pre-Islamic poets, for example, were famed for composing poems about an event or a person on the spot. Considering Muhammad came out with the Qur'an over a period of 23 years, there's nothing miraculous about that. The Qur'an makes the challenge to produce a verse or chapter like it if you are truthful. One of the problems with this challenge is that it can't be tested objectively. In my opinion, many works surpass the Qur'an in Arabic and other languages. Muslims, of course, have a different opinion. Another problem is that if the challenge is to actually produce something exactly like the Qur'an, then this is impossible, because literary works always contain the fingerprints of their authors. It may be true that no one can bring something exactly like the Qur'an, but then no one can bring something exactly like the works of Plato, Al-Jahiz, Atawhidi, Dante, Goethe or Shakespeare. This doesn't, of course, mean they are from God. Finally, most people can't speak Arabic, so they can't take up the challenge. Nor can they even verify the claim that the Qur'an is indeed eloquent. They have to take somebody else's word for it. Personally, I do find the Qur'an eloquent and moving in places, but I also find it weak and badly constructed in other places. This verse, for example, is, in my opinion, clumsy and poorly phrased. What do you think? مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَا وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِمَانِ وَلَكِنْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَضَبٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Whosoever disbelieves in Allah after his belief, save, who, save him who is forced thereto and whose heart is still content with the faith, but whoso findeth ease in disbelief, on them is wrath from Allah and theirs will be an awful doom. And I find this next verse incoherent and disjointed. وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لَكَ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ أَحَاطَ بِالنَّاسِ وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الرُّؤْيَا الَّتِي أَرَيْنَاكَ إِلَّا فِتْنَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَالشَّجَرَةَ الْمَلْعُونَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ وَنُخَوِّفْهُمْ فَمَا يَزِيدُهُمْ إِلَّا تُغْيَانًا كَبِيرًا And when we said to you, Surely your Lord encompasses men, and we did not make the vision which we showed you but as a trial for men, and the cursed tree in the Qur'an as well, and we put terror into them, but it only adds to their great inordinacy. Next, have a look at the bizarre jumping around of pronouns in these verses, changing from you to they and he to we. He it is who makes you travel by land and sea until when you are in the ships and they sail on with them in a pleasant breeze and they rejoice. وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ نَبَاتَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ فَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنْهُ خَدِرًا وَنُخْرِجُ مِنْهُ حَبًّا مُتُرَاكِبًا It is he who sends down water from the skies, then we bring forth with it buds of every kind, then we bring forth with it green foliage, from which we bring forth grain piled up. Had you or I written this, we would be accused of ignorance. But if it comes from the Qur'an, then it's hailed as miraculous eloquence, and the grammarians created a special category called iltifat, meaning sudden transition. Next, look at this verse and tell me, what is the connection between the two subjects? وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تُقْسِتُوا فِي الْيَتَامَةِ فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثَلَاثُ وَرُبَعَةِ فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعَدِلُوا فَوَاحِدَةً أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ ذَلِكَ عَدْنَ أَلَّا تَعُولُوا and if you fear you cannot deal fairly with the orphans, then marry such women as seem good to you two, three, and four. But if you fear you will not do justice, then only one or what your right hand possesses. This is more proper that you may not deviate from the right course. Now look at this verse. Do you find it eloquent? فَنَفَخْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِنَا 
and Maryam the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private part, so we blew into it of our spirit. The tafsir has explained that it was Gabriel who actually did the blowing, and he blew through a gap in her dress, though this hardly makes it any more elegant. There are many more examples of weak verses, and despite what Muslims say, the Qur'an was not greeted by all Arabs as a masterpiece of eloquence. It took a long and violent struggle to win over Arabia. Even then, many rejected the Qur'an's claim to be a miracle, and I've included some quotes in the info box. For example, Ar-Razi, one of the great scientists of the Islamic Golden Age, said, You say whoever denies the Qur'an, let him produce a similar one. Indeed, we shall produce a thousand similar, from the works of the rhetoricians, eloquent speakers and valiant poets, which are more appropriately phrased and state the issue more succinctly. They convey the meaning better, and their rhymed prose is more elegant. By God, what you say astonishes us. You are talking about a work which recounts ancient myths and which at the same time is full of contradictions and does not contain any useful information. Then you say, produce something like it. Now let's take a quick look at the scientific facts which has become very popular amongst Muslims today. I personally never took them seriously when I was a Muslim, and to be fair, a great many of my Muslim family and friends don't pay them much attention either. It's also worth noting that none of the great Muslim scientists of the Islamic Golden Age, who themselves made many scientific discoveries, ever made such claims about the Qur'an. The main claims are concerning embryology, iron coming from space, moon is reflected light, fresh and salt water not mixing, the Big Bang, and seven layers of the atmosphere. As for embryology, the ancient Greeks, amongst others, wrote about it long before the Qur'an. Of course they made errors, but are the Qur'an's brief and ambiguous references really free from error? Take a look at Surah Al-Tariq. فَلْيَنْظُرُ الْإِنسَانُ مِمَّا خُلِقْ خُلِقَ مِمَّا إِنْ دَافِقْ يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بَيْنِ السُّلْبِ وَالتَّرَائِبِ Then let man see from what he has created, from gushing fluid, proceeding from between the backbones and the ribs. Is this really a miraculous scientific description? First of all, what does it mean? Muslims themselves don't agree. The classical tafsirs say it means man is made of fluid that comes from the backbone of the male and the ribs or chest of the woman. Another explanation says it means the man's loins and the woman's pelvic arch. Another says it means the backbone and ribs of both male and female. Yet another says the gushing fluid means the blood of the aorta while another says it refers to the location of seminal fluid. If the gushing fluid means semen, then it's not very accurate, since semen is the medium sperm is carried, and sperm is produced around the testicles, not between the backbone and the ribs. And what about the ovum? The Qur'an never mentions the ovum, which it could have easily referred to as the female egg. Surely any basic description of conception should refer to sperm fertilizing ovum. As for the miracle of sending down iron, the word send down usually mean God simply gave it to them, just as it says elsewhere that God sent down clothing. Ya bani Adam qad anzalna alaykum libasa. In any case, many civilizations were aware that meteors fell to earth containing iron, and the ancient Egyptians called iron ore of the heavens. Does the Quran say the moon is reflected light? No. Noor and Munir do not mean reflected light. On the contrary, if anything, they seem to imply the moon is a source of light. Fresh and salt water not mixing. This verse can have other interpretations, but in any case, this phenomena was known about and sounds like a rewording of the creation story in Genesis. As for the Big Bang, separating heaven from earth is certainly not an accurate description. The heavens existed over nine billion years before the earth. However, again, this verse resembles the creation story in Genesis, as well as earlier creation myths. Finally, the seven heavens described in the Qur'an are obviously not layers of the atmosphere, since it says, we adorn the lower heaven with the beauty of the stars. Nothing in the Qur'an indicates knowledge of unknown scientific facts. Quite the opposite. It reflects the understanding of the time, a flat earth, and a geocentric universe. The claim that Muhammad was illiterate is irrelevant in a society where knowledge was passed on orally. In fact, it would be odd if Muhammad, who came from a noble tribe and was a well-travelled merchant, was not aware of current knowledge, and it's worth mentioning that one of Muhammad's companions, 
Nafi ibn al-Harith, studied Greek medicine in Persia. Perhaps the most revealing point is what the Quran doesn't mention. For example, when Muhammad was asked about the new moons, yes alunaka an al here was a wonderful opportunity just begging for a reference to show how the sun illuminates the moon and causes its phases. Instead, the Quran says, Qul hiya wal hajj. Say they are but signs to mark fixed periods of time in the affairs of men and for pilgrimage. In other words, answering the question with something they already knew. And while we're on this subject, take a look at this verse. وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ كُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ And he it is who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, they each float in an orbit. Surely this is a perfect opportunity to reveal that each day the earth rotates on its axis and goes around the sun, which causes night and day. Instead, we have a verse which sounds suspiciously like the geocentric view that each day the sun and moon go around the earth. Another good opportunity to reveal unknown scientific facts is this verse. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ رَبُّ الشِّعْرَى He is the Lord of Sirius. Sirius was well known to the Arabs as the brightest star in the night sky, and some pagan Arabs used to worship it. However, it is in fact two stars, Sirius A and Sirius B. Sirius B can only be seen with a powerful telescope and therefore was only discovered recently. Here was a perfect opportunity for the creator of the universe to say he is the lord of the two Siriuses and reveal something that was truly unknown. Another missed opportunity is in Surah Fusilat where the Quran says God created the earth in four days and the heavens in two days. For argument's sake Let's accept that day means long period. Surely this was the perfect opportunity to reveal that the universe took much longer to form than the earth. Instead, the Quran gives the impression that it was the earth that took much longer, which again sounds suspiciously like the geocentric view. The Quran talks about boiling water 17 times for the purposes of torture. It would have been nice if just once it could have mentioned that boiling medical instruments in water will kill bacteria and viruses, and also make water safe for drinking, helping to save billions of lives. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. Besides, Muslims are not the only ones to claim there are scientific miracles in their holy book. A Christian friend of mine sent me a list of scientific miracles in the Bible. Here are a few of them. Actually, one can make almost any lengthy ancient text predict something amazing. A recent experiment on the famous poem On the Nature of Things by Lucretius found these scientific miracles amongst others. The claim that the Quran is a miracle that could only have come from a divine source is simply a myth. There is no undeniable or irrefutable evidence that proves anything of the sort. Do, do, do.